Morning Hebron Zion family and friends, and we welcome you once again to our virtual worship service. Friends, as we continue to traverse this pandemic, we continue to remain faithful knowing that God is still with us. And so we are grateful and we are mindful of all the good things God has done and the good things God continues to do. And so we thank God for the use of technology to keep us together, even though we must be apart. Just a few announcements. For those of you who are members here, um, you can see that our sanctuary looks a little different. We are in the midst of a major floor project. And so we just want to say thank you to those who contributed to make this particular project possible. Thanks to the leadership of the Gratitude and Generosity team. And just thanks to God and to those who did not find it robbery to, to commit and give and to be faithful to what it is God is trying to do. Friends, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Before I go into prayer, I'd like to um, ask family and friends to please keep Ms. Lorena Robbins Morrison's family in prayer. Her daughter-in-law, the doc, Dr. Joy Morrison, uh, was in a very serious car accident, and so they are asking for prayers for her uh, recovery as well as for the care of the newborn baby. Let us pray. Holy and eternal God, Lord, we come to you on this morning with glad hearts. God, grateful that we are still one in the number. God, grateful that we can lift up holy praise to you, O oh Lord, for you are worthy to be praised. Oh God, when we look around us, we look in awe of all your creation. We look at the clouds that sometimes brings rain. We look at the sun that sometimes, all times, gives us warmth. Lord, even in the darkness of the clouds, we still see you, O oh Lord, and your handiwork. Lord, as the seasons come and go, we are grateful and ever so mindful that you are in control of all things. And all we are required to do is to be obedient. And so, Lord, as we prepare to worship you on this morning, we just ask that you just reside in our midst. Lord, allow the Holy Spirit to be the Holy Spirit. Lord, remind us to keep the main thing the main thing, and that is Jesus Christ is the Lord. As we prepare, O oh Lord, to hear a word from on high, let us worship you in spirit and in truth. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We will now have a selection from our choir. <laughs> Oh, 
Trouble in my way. Trouble in my way. I have to cry sometimes. I have to cry sometimes. Trouble in my way. Trouble in my way. I have to cry sometimes. I have to cry sometimes. I lay awake at night. I lay awake at night. But that's all right. That's all right. I know that Jesus. Jesus, He will fix it. I know that Jesus. trouble in my way I have to cry sometimes but I know that I know that I know that Jesus Mary's baby that radical rabbi will always fix it trouble in my way I have to cry sometimes trouble in my way but I know Jesus, sweet Jesus, will fix it. He hasn't failed me yet. And so I thank God for that relationship. This morning's sermonic text comes to us from Mark chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him saying, be silent, be quiet, and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing in him and crying with a loud voice came out of him they were all amazed and they kept on asking one another what is this a new teaching with authority he commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him at once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Pray with me if you will. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, for you are my rock and my redeemer. Amen. I'd like for you to think with me this morning from the sermon title, Disruption. Disruption. Have you ever heard the story about the time Satan had a yard sale? You see, Satan thought he would get rid of some of his old tools that were cluttering up his house. There was gossip and slander, adultery and lying and greed and power and hunger. And lust was laid out on the tables as well. Interested buyers were perusing the tables looking for a good buy. One customer, however, strolled way back in the garage and found on a shelf a very shiny tool. It looked well cared for. 
he brought it out to Satan and asked if it was for sale. Oh no, Satan answered, that's my tool. Without it, I couldn't wreck the world. It's my secret weapon. But what is it the customer inquired? It is the tool of discouragement and disruption, the devil said. The more you can discourage people, the more disruption I can create. It allows me to do just what I want to do. And so in this morning's text, we find Jesus in Capernaum at the beginning of his public ministry after time spent in the wilderness and being tempted by the devil. Jesus is in the synagogue giving one of his first sermons and lo and behold, there is a demon in the mix disrupting the atmosphere. You see, this demonic spirit knows who Jesus is. Can you imagine being a preacher, getting ready and geared up to preach, and a demon calls you out? But that's another sermon for another time. But think about it. Jesus shows up to teach, and the first thing he must confront is a demon, my God from Zion. Now, as a preacher, I am all for receiving feedback from the congregation, especially if the word proclaimed resonates with them on an emotional and mental and spiritual level. But Jesus understands what he is up against. A temple filled with men who believe they know all they need to know about God and a demon. But watch this, Jesus is in Capernaum, a rich town where its citizens love to indulge themselves in any and everything and there is more than enough sin to go around. Mark's sole purpose in his gospel is to introduce us, to introduce them to Jesus, the man, Jesus the teacher, and Jesus the the servant. And so as we ponder on this passage this morning, the question becomes, how do we excise those demons or those things that keep us from being in right relationship with God? The first thing I notice in this passage is that Jesus immediately acknowledged the problem. You know, sometimes we know we've got a problem, but we don't want to say we've got a problem because if we say a pro we have a problem, we're going to hurt somebody's feelings. If we say we have a problem, then that means we have to deal with the problem. And so contrary to popular belief, you can't fix a problem unless you are willing to acknowledge that a problem exists. Under different circumstances, the presence of this demon would throw some of us off, so much so that we probably wouldn't be able to finish teaching, let alone preaching. And yes, my friends, there is a difference. But Jesus, that radical rabbi, has no patience with this demonic spirit, and with authority he commands the spirit to be quiet. And I don't know about you, but not many of us like being told to be quiet or to shut up, even when we need to be. This demonic spirit knew right away who Jesus was, and he wanted to get right to it. What do you want with us? The startling thing is, is that those who were learned did not recognize Jesus right away. Oh, they knew the name, but they didn't really know the man. And so friends, would you be able to recognize Christ if he revealed himself to you, or would you need more evidence before you would allow yourself to believe that Jesus was indeed present in your life? Jesus was in the synagogue teaching from Old Testament scripture, teaching from his Bible, preaching with holy boldness, 
trying to convey, not trying, but conveying to them that his life will impact us all. It is because of Jesus' birth and living and death and resurrection that a new day has dawned for us and we are no longer held hostage by the law. That sounds liberating, right? Sweet freedom. But it depends on what it is we need to be freed from. Is it addiction of any kind? Is it alcoholism? Is it drugs? Is it pornography? Or maybe one just needs to be free from gambling or lust or mean-spiritedness. Whatever it is in your life, Jesus already knows. And so what Jesus was trying to get them to understand is that this is a new day, a new teaching, And I'm here as Jesus the Christ, God's Son, sent as a living sacrifice for all of our sins, your sins, mine, theirs. And so in all of this, Jesus stayed focused Jesus knew that his time on earth was short, and so every teaching he taught, it was no nonsense. Jesus didn't waste time trying to prove anything to anyone. Jesus knew what he had to do. And my friends, sometimes we get caught up in the details of life. You know that we sometimes we get so caught up in the weeds and, you know, the devil is always in the details and we miss the message that God is trying to send us. And you see, Jesus knew where he was and Jesus knew what needed to happen. The word had to go forth. And so in putting out the word and teaching the word, you know how we do. If it's good news, we talk it. If it's bad news, we talk it. And so this this passage, it tells us that the listeners were amazed. And yes, the word did go forth, but we don't know if the hearts of the people were really changed for the better or for worse, but we know Jesus kept doing what he was purposed to do. Matthew chapter 4 verse 23 tells us that Jesus went out through Galilee teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. My friends, when we are walking in our purpose, there will always be people waiting to disrupt us. Just like the evil spirit tried with Jesus. But friends, I urge you to keep pushing, especially if you know that what you are doing is good, it is right, and it is pleasing in God's eyes. There was a story about Babe Ruth, the great home run hitter for the New York Yankees baseball team. And during one particular at bat, the umpire, Babe Pinelli, called Babe Ruth out on three strikes. There was a stunned silence in the stands. Babe turned to Pinelli and said, there are 40,000 people here who know that that last one was a ball. And Pinelli replied, maybe so, but mine is the only opinion that counts. And so, friends, when we are about our father's business, when we are doing what we have been called out of the world to do, what we have been purposed to do, we have to do it knowing full well, do it confidently, knowing full well it is what God has called us out to do. 
Oftentimes, we have the authority to tell each other the truth. We have the opportunity to speak truth to power when necessary. But we don't do it because we fear rejection. We don't do it because sometimes we just say it's not my business. But my siblings in Christ, if we cannot speak with authority about who Jesus Christ is and what his life means to us, my friends, we are in trouble. If our lives do not reflect the tenets of the faith, how can we teach anyone about the goodness of Christ and his ultimate sacrifice made for us? My friends, Jesus was not afraid to preach the truth. You didn't have to like it, but he was going to tell you anyway. And so one can only imagine or wonder if the teachers, the learned men in that synagogue, if they understood that this new teaching was designed to save and to heal and not to destroy and corrupt. As we continue in our unstable situation here in the world, we must remember that God is still on the throne. And so as we are going through, it does not excuse us from sharing the good news of the gospel. It does not excuse us from speaking the truth about Jesus with authority. And at the end of the day, my friends, when it comes right down to it, the only authority that should matter in the life of a believer is the authority of God. You see, human beings are authority. It's limited. It's finite. But God's authority is not. And so when we talk about the goodness of the Lord, let us remember all that the Lord has done for us. Let us remember all the trials and tribulations God has seen us through. Let us remember the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives as we live and we work and we serve. Let us remember that they will be disruptions. But we must still keep pushing forward. In the name of the one who was, who is, and who is to come. Amen. Let us pray. Awesome God, loving God, gracious God, God of mercy. Oh God, we come to you in this hour giving thanks. Thanks God for keeping us healthy and strong. Thanks God for keeping us clothed in our right minds. Thanks, God, for your son, Jesus, and for your saving grace. Lord, sometimes we are the disruptors and we don't even know it. Help us to search our hearts, Lord God, and to check ourselves. Remind us, O Lord, that we have been put here to be a blessing not only to ourselves but to others. Remind us, O Lord, that Jesus came to be a servant and not to be served. Help us, God, when we grow weak and weary, not knowing which way to turn. Help us, God, to spread the good news of the gospel, knowing full well had it not been for Jesus, where would any of us be? And so, Lord, we say thank you. Thank you for loving us unconditionally. Thank you for providing for us even in the circumstances we find ourselves in. God, now we lift up those in prayer who continue to work on the front lines, God, doing what you have called them out to do, to be healers, Lord God, and caretakers. Bless them, O oh Lord, the scientists, the doctors, the nurses. Lord, everyone fighting day in and day out trying to save the lives of those stricken with COVID-19. 
Lord, we pray for those who are sick all over the world, asking God that you do what you do so well, bring about healing. Lord, we pray for those, those essential workers who continue to keep pushing, even in the midst of unsafe circumstances. Be their covering, Lord God. Be their guide. And continue, Lord God, to keep them going. Lord, we pray for those who are sick and homebound here in our own congregation, asking God that you would be with them and guide them. And God, provide them comfort. Provide strength, Lord God, for their caretakers. Remind them, Lord God, that you still love them. Remind them of who they are and whose they are, Lord God. God, we lift up the family of Miss Lorena Morrison, God, asking for prayers, Father God, for her daughter-in-law, Dr. Joy Morrison, as well as the infant child. God, you know what needs to happen there. You know what type of healing she needs. We ask that you cover, cover the whole family, cover the mother, mother and the baby. Lord, they both find themselves in difficult circumstances. But God, we know you are a promise keeper. We know you are a healer. And so we just ask, Lord God, that you be with that family. Bless those, the doctors and nurses and dietitians and everyone, Lord God, the therapists that will tend to their care. Help Dr. Morrison to get back to where she was, Lord God. God, oh God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For life, for unconditional love, and for your grace and mercy. We pray for all of our elected officials from the federal level to the local. God asking that you be the voice of reason, Lord God, when there appears to be no reasoning. Lord, help them to remember why they decided to become public servants. We pray for those in the military. We pray for those in public safety jobs. Asking God that you just protect them, guide them, keep them motivated. Even in these stressful times we find ourselves in. Lord, this is our humble prayer. And we pray it in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. At this time, we will have our service of ordination and installation for our elders, deacons, and trustees for the class of 2023. Family and friends, ministry is not done alone. It takes many hands to work in God's vineyard. Ministry is never easy. One of the first things they tell you in seminary, the first question they ask is, are you sure? And of course the answer has to be yes, if God called you. And so in this moment as we prepare to install and ordain the faithful members of this church who said yes to God to do the work that needs to be done in this particular ministry. We give God thanks for you. 
for stepping out on faith for your commitment to do what thus saith the Lord. We thank God for you. It is never easy to say yes, because in saying yes, it comes with a lot. But I promise you, if you do what you do in the name of Christ, you will forever be blessed. Let us pray. Holy and eternal God, God, we thank you for the servants who said yes to your call. God, we thank you for their witness in this particular church, Hebron Zion Presbyterian Church USA. We look forward, Lord God, to see what good works, God, what gifts they bring for the uplifting of your kingdom here on earth. Now, as we prepare, Lord God, to go forth, remind us all, Lord God, that it's all about Jesus and it's not about us. Remind us, Lord God, as we do your good and perfect will, that it's never about our agenda, God, but your agenda. Help us, God, to stay faithful to the office that you have called each and every one of these candidates to. This is our humble prayer, and we pray it in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. There are different gifts. There are different ways of serving God. God works through different people in different ways. Each one is given a gift by the Spirit. Together we are the body of Christ. Though we have different gifts, together we are a ministry of reconciliation led by the risen Christ. We work and pray to make the church useful in the world, and we call men and women to faith so that in the end every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Within our common ministry, some are called and chosen to serve as elders and deacons and trustees. In ordination, we recognize these special ministries, remembering that our Lord Jesus said, whoever among you wants to be great must become the servant of all. And if they want to be first among you, they must be the servants of all. Madam Clark, would you please step to the microphone? God has called you by the voice of this congregation to serve Jesus Christ in a special way. You know who we are and what we believe, and you understand the work for which you have been chosen. Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, one Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Say, I do. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you? Say, I do. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church? as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed by those confessions as you lead the people of God? Will you fulfill your office in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? 
Will you be governed by our church's polity and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Will you in your own life seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbor, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Will you seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? To our elders. Will you be a faithful elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and discipline, serving in governing bodies of the church? And in your own ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? To the deacons. Will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need. And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ to the trustees? Will you be a faithful trustee, watching over the property of this church, ensuring that the property will always be used to to benefit the glory of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Will you work with the members to ensure the upkeep of this property and that monies are properly spent as you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Madam Clerk. Almighty God, let us pray. Almighty God, in every age, you have chosen servants to speak your word and lead your loyal people. We thank you for the elders, deacons, and trustees trustees you have called to serve you. Give them special gifts for their special work and fill them with your Holy Spirit so that they may have the same mind that was in Christ Jesus and be faithful disciples as long as they shall live. Bless all that they do to the end that this whole congregation may glorify and enjoy you forever. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Under normal circumstances, we would be able to kind of surround each other and lay hands, but because of the situation we find ourselves in, consider yourselves touched by all of us. You are now an elder, deacon, and trustee in the Church of Jesus Christ. And for this congregation, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through through him. Amen. On behalf of Heber and Zion Presbyterian Church USA, Charleston Atlantic Presbytery, and the Presbyterian Church USA, I welcome you, we welcome you to ministry. Amen. Thank you all. You can remain, you can stay there, and I'll just give the benediction from the floor. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace now and forevermore. Amen. Oh.